Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tom Landy. I direct the Reverend Michael C. McFarlane SJ Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. We're very happy to have our namesake, uh, Michael McFarlane, here, here today, so it's uh, great to get to say that full title with him here. Each semester, the McFarland Center hosts lectures, conferences, and other programs that explore issues of meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. Last fall, the McFarland Center la launched an initiative titled Catholics and Cultures to develop public events, scholarly conversations, publications, and web resources that explore the lived experience of Catholics in diverse cultures around the world. Today's talk, titled Living in China's Highly Politicized Church is part of that initiative. Today's talk is also one of the Deitchman family lectures on religion and modernity, and we're grateful for, to the Deitchman family for the support that makes it possible. You can learn more about our programs and find past lectures online at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. You'll find this talk online in a few days. Our speaker, uh, Father Paul Mariani of the Society of Jesus, is an assistant professor of history at Santa Clara University in California. His ongoing research focuses on religious policy and conflict in China, and specifically on Christian resistance in China since 1950. He's the author of a 2011 book, For Sale Outside Afterwards, titled Church Militant, Bishop Kung and Catholic Resistance in Communist Shanghai. It explores church-state conflict in a time of mounting tension between the newly victorious Chinese Communist Party and Shanghai's well-organized Catholic community. Father Mariani has an interesting story to tell about how he researched the book, too, including an encounter with some Chinese government archivists who wanted to confiscate the newly declassified dossiers that he uncovered. I'm looking forward to his talk, and please join me in welcoming Father Mariani. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me at Holy Cross. I want to, uh, you know, I'm just delighted to be here. I've thought a lot about this talk, and in fact, I had a little dry run this summer. John Gavin took me through the uh, campus for the first time, and it's a beautiful place. I'm sure we have a, a number of students here and faculty and uh, other well-wishers. My folks, I know, came up from Western Massachusetts, but this is exciting for me to be here. So, as mentioned at the beginning, I'd just like to kind of just jump, jump in and talk about the church in Shanghai today. And when I was thinking about this talk, the first thing I ran into was, okay, so I've studied for years, you know, this church in the 1950s in Shanghai. What was the reality in 1950s? So that's where I got these government documents where they talked about dismantling the church. It was about the, uh, the, uh, the Communist Party attempt early on to have complete mastery over the nation, and so church groups, unions, et cetera, would all come under the thumb of the party. That's the kind of common narrative. And I wanted to do kind of what they call a micro study or a micro history. Well, what about one particular church? And that was easy for me to pick the Catholic Church, right? Especially the Society of Jesus, because the Jesuits had been active in Shanghai for a long time. So I was able to cobble together a lot of uh, sources, and then the, the piece de resistance was finding these sources from Shanghai itself, from the Communist Party, to kind of get both sides. And that's uh, what I put into this book, Church Militant. So then kind of fast forward a few years, and I'm invited to give this talk here at Holy Cross, and it's on the live reality of Catholicism. And I said, boy, I have a little bit of a problem because I know the church in Shanghai to some extent, of course. I've studied it. I've been there. I've spent my years learning Chinese. But now uh, I'm still a foreigner, right? I haven't lived day in and day out in that particular church. And particularly, I've studied uh, the politics of the situation. And what about the live reality, the actual practice? Does that trickle down to the average belief of the ca any Catholic or Christian in Shanghai? And I would say yes, because my, my main contention for this talk is to live in the church in Shanghai is to basically live in a highly politicized church. Uh, we've seen that in Massachusetts. You know, it's my home state, many of your home states with the, with the abuse crisis and such. We've seen the, the layers of politics and how the church and state react, how the media comes into play. Well, I would take all of that for, uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, say, all of that information and then add a whole other layer of politics. And that is what we're having. Uh, that's basically the situation in uh, 
in Shanghai today and China as a whole, but I'd like to particularly focus on the city of Shanghai. Why? Well, just some quick numbers. There's about 12 million Catholics in China, about 140,000 of them in Shanghai. I'll show you some slides, so don't, so don't worry. I'll have something to look at in just a moment. But there's about uh, 20 million people in Shanghai, about 140,000 Catholics. So it's a small minority, but it's vibrant, and it has a number of institutions that has been returned to the church. So I'd like to focus on Shanghai, and particularly on the situation of the bishops. We'll get introduced to four particular bishops. How did this come to be? Do they work together? Do they work against each other? Why are some well past retirement age? So we're going to look at these issues of the four bishops, and I think that that will maybe give us a little bit of a mirror or a window into the life of the average Christian or Catholic in Shanghai today. What does it mean for them? So that's how I'll focus my efforts, Shanghai and Shanghai's bishops. Well, you can see that the issue of bishop, you know, I think for most of us, okay, so we might know who the local bishop is. In China, they are very focused on this because the government wants to control the appointment of bishops. Well, guess what? Who else wants to control the appointment of bishops, right? The Vatican, right? In fact, they say, you know, of course, part of Catholic belief is that, you know, we, we know that over the years there's been certain church-state issues worked out, but by and large, I think especially after Vatican II, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Pope, in communion with the other bishops, will name bishops, make lists of bishops, and select them. And in most of the world, that operates. I know that in, in parts of Europe, there are certain concordates between the church and the state, but most of the world, that works pretty well, except for places like China, where the, the government wants its hand in the situation. So, you might ask yourself, well, who's a real bishop of a certain place? For most Catholics, we say the real bishop is the one that's legitimately appointed. For the Chinese government, they would say, no, the real bishop is the one we appoint. Now, an ideal situation, right, where there's harmony between church and state, and they can kind of perhaps come to an agreement about who the next bishop will be. But in the case of China, this is often fraught with difficulties. So it raises a lot of issue, you know. Uh, who do you pray for at Mass? What bishop do you, do you recognize? There's a number of expatriates who live in Shanghai today, and I've, I've been there, and they've asked questions like, well, you know, is this a, a real church? Is this a patriotic church? Should uh, my, you know, we, we'll be doing business in Shanghai for two years. Can, uh, should my child be confirmed here? Can I somehow uh, uh, find the underground church? I say, no, no, don't do that, please, right? <laughs> Actually, it's, it's often not as scary as you think. It's just that if you try looking, in fact, Often as a Jesuit, we're told, just stay clear of the underground church. We, we, you know, we, uh, we don't want foreigners especially kind of meddling in that. But I've had people come up off the street and kind of say that they're part of this underground church. And I listen to them, but I don't really follow it much further. In fact, I was going to meet some people in Shanghai at one point who were legitimately uh, uh, Jesuits working there but they are not really recognized by the government, so I was gonna wait to the end of my visit to, to uh, visit with them, and then, of course, that was cut short, so perhaps it worked out. But I do know, in fact, some priests have gone to Shanghai recently and met with the unofficial, or the underground bishop, and they were monitored from beginning to end. So those are the issues that we are talking about today. Uh, just a little sense, Shanghai is not a small little town, right? About 20 million people, and this is just one side of it. This is the Pudong side. I visited here in 1990, and that was almost all rice fields. Maybe three or four story buildings as of 1990, and then it went on a construction boom. And then if you flip around on the other side is a famous Bun picture many of you have seen from the 30s and 40s and beyond. And then there's this megalopolis built up around it. So it's a massive, massive city. Uh, this is a, a map I put in my book but uh, these are the major Catholic institutions. So I see it's a ma massive city. This is about 1951. So the Catholic Church goes back in the Shanghai region 400 years. They say Christianity goes back in China maybe to the 7th century. That was sort of a, a, an Assyrian church of the East. They moved from Syria, you know, from the apostolic ages, and it took them seven centuries to get to China. So there were some missionaries uh, to China then, but that church died out. 
And then around the time of Marco Polo and the Mongol Empire, there was another wave of Christianity. Franciscans came over to Beijing, and that wave died, died out. And then finally, the third, you know, you know where this is heading, right? The Jesuits came, and then they, they established the faith once again, and it did not die out. So there you go. Uh, I know there's some self-promotion uh, self there. But uh, basically... That's what we're talking about. That church from Matteo Ricci on, 400 years. In fact, Matteo Ricci himself has a convert, Paul Xu Guangqi. And Xu Guangqi is probably his high, most high profile convert. And he, let me see if I've got this here. Yeah, he lives in this far region down to the left, which is on the outskirts of Shanghai at the time. And so he's baptized, he brings converts to the faith. And the Jesuits establish a little mission here, which after the suppression of the society in the 1840s, they massively build up on ancient foundations. So this goes back 400 years, especially this cluster of Xu Jiahui, Paul Xu Guangxi's hometown. His tomb is still there. And that's where you see the cathedral. And you see there used to be orphanages there. Some are controlled by the government now. Some of the seminaries are turned to government office buildings, but the seminaries, et cetera, but also scattered throughout Shanghai as a whole. So a bit of an institutional footprint, definitely by the 1950s and beyond. OK, so that's a little of the background. Basically, when the Jesuits went back to Shanghai, I say bishop, meaning that uh, Christianity was illegal for a time. It was tolerated perhaps in some areas and maybe the, in the 1700s and the early 1800s. So when foreigners went back in the Opium War, this is a very freighted time in China, right? Because it's a time of high imperialism and the Chinese are getting pushed around. So it's a sad chapter, but it's also the chapter in which Christianity is allowed to go back and trade between East and West occurs once again. Bishops, I'm just focus focusing on the church here, bishops were mostly French Jesuits. I say bishops loosely because it was a mission ter territory. In fact, as some of you know, the uh, United States was still mission territory, so-called, until 1908, which meant that technically they're not bishops, but things like vicars, apostolic. But that's a, that's a side note. So basically, all foreign bishops... There had been one early Chinese bishop, and then around 1926, the Vatican says, we need to have look, this. We call ourselves a Catholic church, right? We call ourselves a universal church. Well, how many of your bishops are local? Well, none. It doesn't look good, right? So they decide to go ahead about 1926 and start ordaining local bishops. And that reaches Shanghai on the eve of the communist uh, uh, take of the city. So it's kind of a very interesting time. You know, maybe it was almost the hand was forced. Now we have to have a local bishop for sure. So this is Ignatius Kung, K-U-N-G, or other, uh, you could also spell it by pinyin G-O-N-G, Ignatius Kung Ping Mei at his uh, installation as, uh, I kind of like that pomp and circumstance, right? Or wouldn't you... <laughs> Very nicely done, but I, this is actually a photograph of a photograph because you can imagine later on in history with the Cultural Revolution, a lot of this stuff was lost or destroyed, so it was hard to get actual images, but some people held on, and so I think this is a photo of a photo of Ignatius Kong. So he is the first Chinese bishop, not a Jesuit. He has the name Ignatius, but he is diocesan priest close to the Jesuits, the first bishop of Shanghai, and there he is. This is, I guess, the... Uh, Original. I've met old missionaries in Taiwan who still carry his picture in their uh, wallets. And then again in procession, hard to find you know, so-called action shots, but I think that shows a little bit of the, the makeup of the, the churches heavily uh, Chinese. I mean, there were expatriates there at the time, but it was an indigenous church as well with long roots. Well, what happens? He's named bishop in 1949. And then this is exactly what my book, Church Militant, uh, talks about. There is a serious conflict between the Catholic Church. Basically, Pope Pius XII took a hard line against communism. And the Chinese uh, responded in kind, basically wanting to completely control the church. So th those are the events that I relate in my book. Uh, you can imagine they let the bishop work for about five or six years, but the noose was kind of tightening during these years. And, uh, well, the whole story's in the book, but basically by 1960, 1955, he's arrested, put in jail, and 1960, 
uh, brought to trial. And I actually got these photos from Shanghai. I was astonished. I went to a collector and I just uh, asked if he had religious stuff. And you know, that's a, just, just shooting out something, you know, uh, to see how he would respond. And sure enough, he produced these. And I, I looked closely at them and I suddenly realized, well, they're in the middle, uh, you know, with a high forehead. That's Kung. That's uh, Bishop Kung on trial. And to his left is uh, Jin Lucien, who we'll get to shortly. But these are the actual, I actually own these. I bought them. I could not believe it. They were not destroyed. But these are the trial photos of Bishop Kong. There are four of them, of which I will, I will show, you, show you one. Well, Kung himself is then replaced, right? Because uh, there's something in canon law that says, you know, that the bishop should not be impeded. But if he is, you know, he continues to be the bishop, the government said, well, the bishop is impeded. Well, how? Well, he's in prison. Whose prison? Our prison, right? So he's impeded. So therefore, we need another bishop. And here's our man in the middle, Zhang Jiaxu, Bishop Zhang, uh, uh, third one in. This is taken probably, I mean, I, might, I don't want to read too much into this, but this was taken about 1960 at the time of the Great Famine. I see people look a little emaciated, but you be the judge of that. So this is even Shanghai is affected by, by the Great Famine. And Bishop Zhang takes his place. He's also another Jesuit. Kung is in the Ward, Ward, Ward Road Jail, and, Kung, and Zhang takes his place. The Vatican does not sign off on Zhang. He's Ill illegitimate, and the real bishop is in prison. So that's the standoff. And that's basically the situation we have for the next 20 years, from about 1960 to 1979. 20 years. Those are the years of the Cultural Revolution and other events. But this is the, I, where, where I would trace the, the break between so-called patriotic church and underground church. Now, I would say that some people don't really like that. They say it was always one church, but still, you know, is a difference in degree or kind, and we'll get into the, some of the complexities shortly. But basically, it was a very divided church. Those that still sided with Kung, and they kind of worshiped underground or kind of had to hide their faith, and those that went along with Zhang and at least publicly would go to churches. Although I, I was told church attendance then was way down because of the Cultural Revolution and such. So that's from 1960 to about 1979. Uh, it wasn't, as I was reminded at the beginning of the talk, it wasn't just Catholics or Christians or other religious believers who suffered in China. Almost the whole nation suffered. I mean, for example, uh, Deng Xiaoping's own son was harassed by red guards during the Cultural Revolution, and we're still not sure whether he was pushed out of a second-story window or was sort of a, a coerced into it, but he is, uh, ha has been handicapped for life uh, because of that. So a lot of people suffered in those years, but I, you can't take on China as a whole, right? You have to focus on one thing, and I wanted to focus on how was the church treated at this time. So basically, until 1985, let's kind of move ahead to the year. Uh, students, none of you were born then, were you, 1985? It seems like yesterday. Remember the long hair and the rock and roll and all that? I still remember that like it was yesterday. Well, okay, so this is Zhang much later on, much later on. Uh, and the Cultural Revolution, I'm not really sure what happened to him. Some people say that he was sidelined too because the whole country went through a violent kind of anti-religion. Even those people that cooperated with the government and the Cultural Revolution were kind of uh, pushed down. So that was just the facts of the Cultural Revolution. And here he is later to the far right, Zhang, never uh, formally reconciled with the Vatican or Rome, so kind of considered in this kind of nebulous state of being an illegitimate bishop. Okay, so there's Jin today, Aloysius Jin Lucien. 1985, what happens? Well, in the early 1980s, suddenly you go through this, early, this reform era, and the government sort of almost apologizes for the way it treated some people. People in labor camps are rehabilitated, people are sent back home from the countryside, etc. This is the main narrative of the early 1980s, and economic reforms begin. And therefore, for churches, it's impacted because Churches are given back to the church groups. Priests are released from prison. Lay people are released from prison. This is across the country. This is going on in the early 1980s. Uh, they start to open up in terms of uh, allowing Western music back into China, et cetera. Dress starts to change. So this is the reform era. 
And so someone like Jin Lushin, who's a Jesuit, suddenly is released from prison, and Bishop Jiang is ill. So this is the first of the key bishops I want to speak to today. The government says we have to ordain a new bishop. So Jin Lushin steps up to the plate. The only problem is Cardinal Kung, oh, excuse me, I tipped my hand there, Bishop Kung is still in jail. So how can you name a bishop when a legitimate bishop is still in jail? So he is a highly controversial figure today in China still. On the one hand, he's done incredible things with opening up churches. He's got, uh, you know, uh, some, some things going for him. For example, uh, multilingual. Uh, even back in the 1950s, he was translating parts of the New Testament at the Chinese at a popular level. And uh, he's a shrewd political operator because, you know, he's obviously seen China from the inside. He's been in labor camps and prisons. So his view is probably, you know, save what can be saved. I'm going to go ahead with this, allow the government to consecrate me as a bishop. And uh, that's going to infuriate other Catholics in Shanghai because the one thing you didn't do in those years of resistance is kind of turn your back on the universal church and on the Pope. That's the one thing you didn't do. And here it is, it seems that he's doing that in a very public way. His point of view is, you know, the church is in a shambles in Shanghai. And I know how to put it back together. And he did. And he put up built up institutions. He was able to get foreign money into China from uh, charitable groups in Germany and overseas, and he rebuilt the diocese. So again, a Jesuit, someone who was known uh, for his resistance. You saw his picture earlier sitting next to Bishop Kong, right, on trial. So someone who, everyone here, I mean, sometimes it's a difference, as someone said, of uh, why do these different groups hate each other? Well, some spent 30 years in the labor camps and some spent 20, right? So this is kind of the realities that we're talking about with Jin. So he offends people in the underground church. He does the one thing that he's not supposed to do, and yet he seems to be the right man at the right time to kind of save the church, build up the institutions. He sent his seminarians abroad to learn French and English and German and then returned to to China. So that's his legacy for about the last 20 and more years, Bishop Jin. There he is. He, he gives a number of interviews as well. So in some cases, succeeding brilliantly, in other cases, deeply offending people. Well, by 1988, what happens? And I've actually met the other day with Joseph Kong, the nephew of Bishop Kong, well, he, became, he becomes a cardinal. In fact, in 1979, when John Paul II was first made, well, was, was made pope, he named him in pectore, which means secretly in the heart. He was the, bish he was the bishop named, but he was not allowed to actually become a cardinal officially until 1991. And the word is, you know, if he had died in between, no one would ever know that it was him. So Cardinal Ignatius Kung Ping Mei, this is taken about 1991. You can see the, the obvious affection, right? I don't think the Pope usually kisses a lot of people on the head, right? But, but uh, I think this probably their shared uh, struggle against uh, communist regimes. I, I would have to say that that's part of it. So this is uh, uh, Cardinal Kung in 1980. Excuse me, 1991. In the meantime, uh, let's go back here for a second. Jin is doing everything. You can imagine, I, I'm, I'm always finding news stories about the relationship between Jin and Kong, you know, because Kong finally leaves China. He never wanted to leave China, but for health reasons he does, and he does not go back. And then Jin is the sole bishop there. Okay. Number two of the main bishops, of the living bishops today in Shanghai. The number one, Jin Lushin. By the way, he's in his mid-90s. And when I was last in Shanghai, you know, he would complain that, you know, you think he, he was going to die in a few days. And then five years later, he's still going along, right? In fact, with Kung himself, I remember reading a, a letter from the early 1960s saying, Bishop Kung is not going to make it. He's, well, excuse me, but he's vomiting blood. He's here in the middle of the prison. And sure enough, he lives another 40 years. So you get the, you get the, uh, you get the idea. So number two. So about 1985, the same year, what seems to have happened is when Jin gets named by the government to be bishop, Fan says, well, we need a, you know, a real bishop for Shanghai. So in a clandestine manner, one month later, in February of 1985, 
Fan, Bishop F-A-N, Fan becomes the Bishop of Shanghai. And you can imagine, right, as soon as the government finds out, they're not going to let him function. So I was just talking to somebody recently. If you want to see Fan, uh, you go at your own peril because uh, one time uh, Cardinal McCarrick of New York, uh, excuse me, New, uh, Washington, D.C., right, he went to Shanghai and tried to get there, but they apparently took him out of where he was living to a kind of a, a guest home. So you can't really reach him. And there's all kinds of rumors. I was, even in my book, I said something that he had Alzheimer's, and then someone says that's just a misinformation. He doesn't have Alzheimer's. I don't know. But I did find out there was this one little article in this crisis, which is this kind of a more conservative Catholic magazine, but this guy actually met Fon. And then I found out the story just recently. He was told, if you want to see him, you have to go to you know, the outskirts of Shanghai. And he lives in these back alleys in this you know, home. But you walk backwards. Well, why? Well, because the security cameras, they don't, you don't want them to get a, a full frontal of your face, right? So walk backwards, and they maybe go at this time when the, when the watchman is off on his lunch break. And this is particularly what he did. And he was able to interview Fon briefly and come back and write an article. And apparently the security apparatus found out about it, but they didn't have images of the guy's face. And by the time they figured it out, he had left the country. So I don't want to engage in that kind of work. Maybe some of you want to do that. But that's what you will have to do if you want to meet uh, the unofficial, uh, the underground bishop in some area. So that's Fon. Uh, interesting thing about Fon, Bishop Fon, is... Uh, he is a classmate from the novitiate of Bishop Jin, of this man. So they entered the Jesuits uh, in the same, the same exact day. Uh, I think it was uh, about the 1930s. So they both entered the Jesuits the same day. And obviously, uh, uh, Jin, at that time, there was a kind of a clear pecking order. He was sent abroad. He, he did the longer course, was sent abroad to study. And Fan never was sent abroad. But... At that time in the late 80s in China, what you needed was maybe two conditions, to maybe to be an underground bishop or a bishop of that community was a, you're still in reasonably good health, that you've made it through the labor camps and you're okay. And two, you've never compromised, you know, or at least people, you know, or you've compromised very little with the government. So all you, you meet those two conditions and Fan becomes sort of the, the, the favorite of the underground church. So how, what would that look like? Well. When these priests, et cetera, go back to Shanghai in the 1980s, the churches in shambles, you know, uh, churches that have been turned into cultural palaces or ware warehouses or, you know, storage depots, uh, stained glass has been destroyed. This is all in the 1960s in the Cultural Revolution. So you rebuild that, but then you find out, oh, by the way, the government is kind of loosening its grip over the churches in China, but it's also trying to control it. So... If you don't go along with the government or become part of this patriotic association, you're still on the outs. What do they say? The so-called underground church says, well, look, do what you want, right? I've been in prison for 20 years. I'm not going to give in now, right? So that's just a fact of life. So we're not gonna, we didn't compromise then. We're not going to compromise now. So that's the kind of the reality of the underground church. So what do they do? They would often go back to family members say mass, hear confession, whatever, in their own apartments. And that's the kind of the rebirth of the underground church. And by the way, you can also see the Vatican playing its hand in here because it allows the, I mean, at any time the Vatican could say, we're not going to allow bishops to be ordained for the underground church in China. But they allowed it because they thought it was a good course of action. But it's also a risky course of action too. But that's what they permitted to take place. Okay, so that's Bishop Fan, that's number two. So first is Jin, J-I-N. Second is Fan. Well, you can ask yourself, okay, so who is the real bishop still then of Shanghai, right? With a real, well, there should be a TV show, right? With a real so-and-so, please stand up. With a real bishop, please stand up. I didn't find this out until much later, but apparently... In 2005, let's push ahead to 2005, just seven years ago. We're in 2005, and the Vatican has reconciled with Jin. And how did they know this? Well, we didn't know, because Jin wasn't saying, you know, because, in fact, they think he didn't want to say, because the minute he said, the government, 
would have problems with him. So he didn't say he was a legitimate bishop. And then the Pope had a synod of bishops in Rome, and four bishops from China were, were invited. Well, the thinking goes, the Vatican is not going to invite an illegitimate bishop to Rome, right? It's not going to give it their stamp of approval. So, and it looks like that was the exact date that he had been reconciled. So, end of story. No, there's a little bit of a rub. What is the rub? And this was told to me by some, uh, the Cardinal of Hong Kong. He said, the bishop, the regular bishop of Shanghai is Fan, the underground bishop. He is the principal bishop. His coadjutor bishop, his auxiliary bishop with right of succession is Jin. Now, Jin will never say that publicly, right? Jin is older than Fan. Okay, so that's the reality. The bishop is Fan. The underground bishop is the real bishop. And he has been reconciled, but he is not. He can't, you can only have one bishop of a place, a main bishop. And so he's, so he's his successor bishop. It's funny, right? Because he's in his mid-90s. He's older than the bishop, but he is a successor. This is a very diplomatic Roman solution to a thorny problem, right? Both of them are 20 years past retirement. So that's the reality in 2005. But it's all, also clear that by 2005, you need a new bishop, right? So, oh, by the way, uh, use those Latin phrases I, if I can. De facto, de jure, right? Fan is the bishop. De facto, it's Jin because he's public, he has a, he's in the chancery, he's the one with the money, he's the one with the power, etc. And Jin, Fan, is living in a back alley somewhere in Shanghai with a security camera pointed right at his, at his house. So he can't do a great deal. And I should say Jin is, the, is de facto in charge, but under the heavy, heavy monitoring of the state. Okay, so that brings us up through those two. So... Then we get to 2005. By this time, uh, Cardinal Kung has died, Zhang is long gone, and we're talking about two bishops in Shanghai, and now a third. This young man here, uh, Joseph Xing, I know these names are tough, X-I-N-G, Xing, X-I-N-G, Joseph Xing, at his consecration as bishop in 2005. This also showed that not only had the Vatican reconciled with Jin during this time, but at the end of his consecration as bishop, he stood up and he read a, a statement that said, I have papal approval. So here we have a government approved bishop that's also approved by the, uh, the Vatican or vice versa, right? So it looks like church and state are working harmoniously in this case, obviously a public case, and he reads that he is in fact approved by the Vatican. So signed off in both cases. Now, the interesting thing is, you can imagine who are they going to pick these bishops from. At this time, most priests in Shanghai are either 70 and 80 and above, right, or 30 or 40. All those years of the Cultural Revolution are kind of a lost generation. So you, you're going to have eight very old bishops, or you're going to have some of the youngest bishops in the entire Catholic Church right there. He's in his 40s. Let's see. So Xing, uh, you know, grew up a product of his time. Some important strengths and weaknesses. What are the strengths? Well, he's recruited from outside of Shanghai. And this is what Jin, this is, just shows how smart Jin is. He knows that the number of uh, vocations in Shanghai, it's a big city, it you know, has all the same issues of big cities, you know, one child policy, so families with only one people, one, one child, etc. So he, he invites religious sisters and priests from poorer inland provinces, I guess, where, you know, temptations are fewer, distractions are fewer, etc. And that's, this is where he gets someone like Xing. So, but he's not a native of Shanghai, so he doesn't speak the local dialect. And uh, so he both has both strengths and liabilities as well, Bishop Xing. He publicly states that he has the backing of the Pope. Okay, you see the dilemma, right? If you are an underground bishop, your hands are tied. Maybe you can get some work done. But if you're completely government approved, but you don't have the backing of the, of, of, of the, uh, the whole church, you're illegitimate. No one's going to follow you. So if you have both of them, you have the best of both worlds. And that was the promise that Xing, that there was going to be a new age of harmony between the church and the state and the pastoral needs of the people of Shanghai could be met. Well, there he is on the day of consecration, 2005. Okay, 
This is where I wanted to lead my story. I was uh, actually vacationing with my parents this summer in Cape Cod, and my dad came out and said, hey, Paul, did you read what just happened in Shanghai? And, you know, here I am, you're supposed to, you know, maybe know something about the church in Shanghai. And I said, what? He said, well, there was a problem. So let me get back to 2011. It seems that more and more he was marginalized. So he realized he had big shoes to fill, but he realized that the government was more and more demanding its pound of flesh. And it looks like there he is in a happier age. He's given a couple years of pastoral work. And then this, I mean, you, you know, this is talk about reading tea leaves, but I don't want to read too much into this, but you can see that what they said was he's there on the far right. You see him there? But he's not cooperating. This is a big meeting of the Chinese Bishops' Conference, which would include legitimate and illegitimate. They, the government wants to make this into a big publicity campaign for itself. And he's not going on. He's not wearing any signs that he's a bishop. And he's shying away from photos. That's what they say. So this is the closest thing on, uh, what's that website? Google. This is what I could find on there uh, of a Bishop Shing sort of having passive uh, disobedience. To the, to the government. And so over time, he's sort of shunned. He's crossed the red line. He's not going along with what the government wants. So that's where we get it. The, the internet stories have stories like the case of the missing bishop. And to this day, the best we can figure out, he's sent back to his home village up in the north of China. He's probably under watch. The government might recognize him still as a bishop, but they don't allow him to function as one. So he crossed a red line. Well, what are we going to do, right? So by the way, a Xing would be an auxiliary bishop. You, they can get moved around a little bit more easily, I think, right? So then suddenly we have Bishop Ma, M-A. Bishop Ma is, uh, this past summer, he is put forward as the new bishop. It looks like the Vatican and the Chinese government both say yes, which means that the Vatican is also going along with the fact that the other bishop, the other young bishop, is sidelined. Well, this is the stunning move that he makes. He is consecrated, made bishop, and at the very end of it, did anyone hear the story what happened to him? As soon as he is consecrated, he says, it's no longer convenient for me to be part of the patriotic association. So here he is someone who the government chooses that they think that they could work with or control, and he is allowed to be consecrated. The problem was, you know, if you talk about church law, some of us maybe know something about church law. Well, the, those in the Chinese government who study the Catholic Church know a lot more than some of us, and they know that they can get into the system because you're supposed to have three bishops consecrating a bishop, usually one principal bishop, two co-consecrators. So the government comes in with a third or fourth or a second who was an illegitimate bishop. So maybe, okay, that's okay. But some people maybe with more scruples would say, I don't want that illegitimate bishop placing his hands on my head and then kind of uh, messing up the whole situation. So he must have thought about this beforehand. And in his acceptance speech, he thanked certain bishops for being there, but there was an illegitimate bishop present. So when he went to lay his hands on his head, he jumped up and embraced him. That's a nice little move, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also a very clear signal that he's not going to allow government intervention. Why do you think he did this? Well, look, it's probably clear that he saw everything that had happened. He saw the government try to manipulate the consecration. He saw what happened to Bishop Ma. He saw the way the Catholic you know, people were being pushed around in China year in and year out. And I think he, and then also there was one uh, very tough-minded religious sister, a superior of the religious congregation there in Shanghai, who basically sat out of the consecration. And I think she asked her religious sisters not to attend so after this happened, she was removed. So the government actually removes religious sisters there. It's so a very interesting story. She said she's not going to go to the consecration because she doesn't like what's happening. And then they find out, the government finds out later who was part and parcel of this, and, and she's removed. So let me, do we have just a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay, let me just show you a clip of this actually taking place.
Can you hear that there? A little bit? Is it tough? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, it's in China, of course. And I, I listened to it. But anyway, he's basically saying, I'm stepping down. I'm stepping down from the Patriotic Association. And then you can hear the applause. <laughs> this is a, full of functionaries and such. But, but still, I mean, this is a spontaneous applause, un un unexpected. May we all be one. So there's a clear signal there. May we all be one. Underground and patriotic. And then he's whisked away a couple hours later. Let me show you what someone else did. This is the beauty of, uh, of uh, YouTube. You can find things like this. This was posted almost immediately, uh, maybe a couple days later. Uh, this has turned him into a symbol of resistance. From today on, it's not, it's not convenient for me to be part of the patriotic church. And then you'll start to see what this, this person has done here. that we all may be one. And then this is kind of unmistakable here. There you go. So this is, this is on YouTube. It gives you a sense of him turning into a symbol of resistance. One other thing I wanted to show you here. Uh, this is the size of Shanghai. So you can zoom in and just get the sense of how big this city really is. I don't want to do too much with it, but it, this is the, the slide I showed earlier, and this is where it's mostly built up, but a massive kind of megalopolis, and we can back it out. So it's not a little, yeah, it's, a, it's this whole area, the Yangtze uh, Delta Basin on down, maybe 300 million people going all the way out, and in, in the Shanghai, maybe 20 million. So you can see the whole area is heavily impacted, this whole area, right? So uh, just conclusion, I'll just quick conclusion. Uh, we see the reasons why he did this, and I think it raises an interesting question for us as well. You know, where should the church be, basically? Uh, what, what, what are the ways forward? Basically, well, he could recant his current position, right? And that's what I've heard the latest the government would like him to do, recant his current position. But he must have thought of that in advance, right? Because you don't make such a, a bold, prophetic, maybe controversial stance without thinking it through. So I don't think he can recant, but it looks like the government wants him to publicly do that. It would be devastating, I think, for the church. Secondly, he can remain what he has become, at least on that YouTube clip, right? A symbol of resistance, but also of unity for the Catholic community. Third, maybe the government could quietly back down and uh, let him exercise his role. And fourth, they could try to name another bishop. But I think, you know, they've already tried two in the last uh, few years, so I don't know if that's going to, to work. And I think to kind of end on the note of, you know, the, the lived practice of the, of the faith, I think a lot of this is the pressure from Catholic lay people. You know, they don't want to see their bishops turn into political pawns, you know, with lavish study trips, et cetera, under the control of the party. They want them to act more like this, and that is, deal, you know, uh, feeding the flock or working with the flock, evangelizing, pastoral work. And that's exactly what I think he speaks of, unity among the church, but also pastoral work and evangelization. So the last question I have is, you know, where should the church be working from? You know, the chancery or the catacombs? So there you go. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions. <laughs> yes. Were both Jesuits. What was the policy of the Society of Jesus? Were they, were they in conflict with the superiors, or, or what was the aim of 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. You know, I was doing some research at one point and I saw in the Jesuit catalog that gin had died in the Cultural Revolution. So they published his obituary. So for many years, actually, fellow Jesuits thought he had died. And then the word came out, I think, with the General Colvinback and the others, that he was a Jesuit in good standing. So that was sort of a thumbs up. And that he was, you know, the fact is, Jin labored as an illegitimate bishop for 20 years. So imagine, you know, the cases of conscience of many Catholics. Should we go along with Jin? He's illegitimate, and yet he's doing all this wonderful work. So the, the society was split as well. There were big supporters of Jin among fellow Jesuits, and I've met them, and you know who they are. And there's others who really do not like him, and you meet them, and you know who they are. So it, it, it was a bit divided. I think trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, but also realizing he was in a very irregular situation. Yes, I'll go over here quickly, yeah. Oh, that, 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 that didn't like. Okay, usually early on, by the way, except for that Bishop Zhang, all of these had been reconciled with Rome either from the beginning or at the end. There's only one who had not, and that is Zhang. And I think the Vatican could never go with, along with Zhang because you can't just replace a business, the bishop because he's in prison. So I, I think it was fidelity to Rome. That was a, the big thing, or to the universal church. Maybe other issues would be submerged, but the real issue was, you know, if you turn our, your back on us, and you accept, you know, being consecrated without the papal mandate, you know, you've kind of spoken for yourself. And I did read something recently that uh, the, the, the Vatican has a very nuanced position about this, is this canon law 1382 about how to name a bishop, and they allow uh, mitigating circumstances. So if you're forced into it or something, it lessens the impact. But basically, if you accept being a bishop, Without the thumbs up of Rome, you're in a bit of hot water because you, you sow confusion among the faithful. So it's a very tricky issue, but that's where we're basically at with it. So when he said it's no longer right. convenient, yeah. you said that they <coughs> take them off somewhere? So apparently, within a few hours. So apparently, there was a whole banquet set, of course. It's a very, you know, it's a Chinese consecration. You know, you stick around for the meal <laughs> after, too, right? You don't, you don't just leave. And, but then after you finish your dessert, you're gone. I've noticed this many times. After you finish the last meal. So basically, that's where he was at with this, is uh, the functionaries, the government officials did not attend the banquet, of course. And there was probably furious phone calls going back and forth. And within a few hours, he's whisked away. Now, he's not imprisoned in that sense. It's not those days anymore. <coughs> but he is put under house arrest at the seminary. And that's where he is. Although some people say he's writing on his blog. And I've looked for that, actually. And I found some stuff. But some people say, well, that's not really him. I don't know. But uh, he is sort of, uh, now, I don't think people want to go see him because it would just cause more trouble. So that's, you have these two young bishops, one under house arrest locally, and one sort of monitored uh, under house arrest in the north. Questions back here. Go ahead. Do you remember there was a great age difference between the bishops? Yes. And I heard some time ago that uh, this might have been true early on in the 80s when China was opening up again because um, the grandparents handed down the faith to the young children and the parents were, you know, uh, off busy working or else had been so subject to kind of atheist education that they dropped away from their faith. So to some extent, there is truth to that. I'm trying to think of the... Of the, nor the uh, Bishop Jin has no, see, in some ways I think Shanghai, we talk about the best of both worlds. In some ways it's the worst of both worlds because you have heavy government interference, but you also have all of the kind of enticements of the distractions of a big city. I mean, shopping is huge in Shanghai. Certainly, in fact, that, that's, that near where the cathedral is, if you walk up the street a little bit, there's a, a kind of rotary, nothing like our Massachusetts rotaries. I mean, this is a massive, massive rotary with five shopping malls around it. 
right? So some people are drifting away from the church for other reasons as well. But the exact demographics, I think it's, 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 it's mixed. And I think that's one of the beauties of the church in Shanghai and other places. You'll have young and old, rich and poor, expatriate, local. So I've not done a clear study, though, on, on the breakdown. Of the, of the, but that's true of the so-called leadership. Go ahead. Yeah, I think most, so, see, the latest thing that happened in the Pope's letter of 2007, tucked away at the back, they took away the canonical basis of the underground church. So that means, at least at that point in 2007, the Vatican said that they would not go ahead with, allo with allowing these underground bishops to exist. It was an issue of survival, basically. I don't think they would thought themselves as pawns. I mean, it was an issue of survival. Uh, if you go back to the 1960s, the church really thought it was going to be destroyed completely or obliterated. So how do you, you do anything you can to survive? And one thing you do to survive is, you know, uh, ordain these underground bishops. The trouble was, I think, in not just Shanghai, but other places, was the system got a little bit out of control. So, you know, I, I'm a bishop now, and I'm afraid that I'll be killed or, 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 or I'll die soon. So I or, ordained three or four more new bishops, right? And then we have competing jurisdictions, et cetera. So it kind of got, it ran a little bit away. So the, I think the Vatican would like to see some sort of agreement with the Chinese government, but it just will not happen. It just, it, it keeps hemorrhaging. You know, we, we get very close and it falls apart. So that's basically where we're at right now. But as for political pawns, I guess, you know, some of them might not be the biggest friends of the Communist Party, but I think it was more for their survival of the church. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, how does, like, are there, uh, is Catholicism more prominent as, like, as far as Christian religion in China than others? Or, like, what's kind of, like, the difference? The latest information is that the, the, uh, the Catholic Church has grown, and I think maybe beyond uh, popular, uh, just natural birth rates, but there's been an explosion of uh, kind of evangelical Christianity in China. Some people would say up to 100 million or more. I think that might be too high, uh, but there's, a, there's kind of a, a great ferment in China, and every time I've kind of tried to access it, I get somewhere, but it's, it's uh, you know, you'll see it, you'll see some churches full, you'll see people saying, oh, I belong to this or that, uh, either three-self church or maybe an unofficial church. So, so, so evangelical Christianity has grown quite a bit too, uh, more than the Catholic Church. I, I don't know if this is true, but sometimes I think that the, the Catholic Church, you know, um, you know, the keep the faith, right? Keep the faith. They, they kept the faith, and the, the, the evangelicals kind of spread the faith. You know, that might be a little bit too, too but I, I don't think that the, the, the information is not all in yet. I mean, there's, there's, uh, it's still evolving, this whole situation in China, but that's the latest we have. There was an article recently, some years ago, on how many Christians in China, and the bottom line, we don't know. You know uh, we don't know, but uh, it has definitely grown. Go ahead. Um, you, at, toward the end of your talk, you talked about the, the people and the people wanting uh, you know, the bishops to sort of support the faith. Um, I'm wondering about the people as opposed to the Episcopal structure. Right, right, right. That uh, were they, uh, I mean, are some of them kind of members of both the underground church and the politically approved church? Uh, I mean, it, do they see the separation as clearly as the Episcopal situation? Right, they, they have definitely felt this. And I, I know of one woman in particular who works for the diocese now who probably came from families that were more on the underground side of things but she worked with Bishop Jin in the translation pro projects, et cetera. So I think there is some back and forth, but I think um, the current, at least in Shanghai, is with all of these bishops sort of approved by Rome, hopefully that distinction is being erased. And it, it's just funny that this action that he took, this kind of bold action, may do a lot to actually create reconciliation. It's unfortunately has to be kind of in the face of the government, but I, I think every time the government pushes 
any religious body or group like this, there's pushback. So it's very, it's, it, it gets very complex, but basically I think that they definitely feel these things, you know. And uh, I had uh, someone say, you know, I, I try to email in and say, what's going on? But I'm not going to get an answer right because they're afraid maybe it'll be monitored. But someone said, oh, recently that their Hotmail account had been destroyed. Now, part of me says, oh, that happens. But then part will, there was something behind that. So I think that they feel under, under, under watch and under pressure. In fact, if you go to other parts of China, they're often very kind. And, you know, no matter if they worship publicly or underground, but they'll say, just pray for us. And I kind of know what that means, right? You know, just pray for us, you know. So, you know, these are all very patriotic. They love China. They love their country. But they just feel that, like, the government is just getting too involved, you know, that maybe they should deregulate religion. I don't know. But they're just too involved in their lives. Um, thank you for that. I have lived in China for a long time. I was there in 1979. And one of my most, I guess, memorable moments was being in a cathedral in Beijing when it had its first mass. Oh, yeah, sure. Pride. But what I wanted to say is I think a lot of people don't really care about this division. Mm. They want solace, and that especially now that the economic reforms are creating great gaps, and they're in as you know, there are churches springing up all over. And I think this resistance that is this sort of pushback from the people yeah, is yeah. part of the general resistance to the government. Frightened in the Chinese government yeah. at this point. So, you know, I, I think it's part of a bigger picture of a lot of turmoil because of the reforms and the gaps between the rich and the Chinese people will say Christians are kind. Yeah, sure. Christians are kind. That's why we want to be Christians. And they don't say Catholics or church or anything, but right. something about community, I think, is what they're talking about. That's, I think you're right. I think this one good thing there is that there, there is a kind of a, a sense of goodwill or kind of a, um, giving uh, Christians the benefit of the doubt in China, more or less, you know, that they are, they're thankful for the work they do. And, you know, I think for, for some, you know, some of us may, you know, have our issues with central authority or something in a church, but for Chinese, it's like the limb for them to connect with the worldwide church, and they don't want that severed. They want that connection to be intact. And I think you're also right. There's always a much larger co context, and that is one thing that's going on in China now is in November, they'll have uh, about every 10 years they actually hand over power and this has been it was just announced that it's going to be in November so they kept it kind of tightly under wraps so there's there's a bigger picture of where the government look the government you know the, the Chinese Communist Party you know has kind of opened up China lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and yet people want more right I mean they they resent kind of not having certain freedoms that we we kind of accept Oh, okay, let me, uh, any students, any, uh, I took a few students, but I have to take at least one or two more. Oh, behind me. Oh, very good, go ahead. Uh, do you think um, Bishop Jin was a patriotic bishop? Yeah, so he, he actually, you know, they always fudge around with the words, but the fact is he went ahead and, and was named, he was a member of the Patriotic Association, and he still is, so he went along and worked with the government, and uh, the fact is, but he was not approved by Rome for about 20 years and then finally reconciled. So he, uh, you know, so, so like in a certain sense, he's not the real bishop, but he's, he's doing what he can, but he's the only bishop that can function, you know, so he's kind of stuck in a very difficult position. I'm, well, I'm pretty shocked that he actually kept his views even being under prison for, for, for so many years. I'm, I mean, I, you, you would assume that being in prison would have gone I'm guessing in 20 years you would change some of your views, but I guess not. That didn't even affect him at all. I think, I think you're ex exactly right. You know, we, I didn't go into it too much today because I want to do the contemporary scene, but uh, at least the, the older bishops there that we dealt, they all were in prison for many years, as were Catholic lay people. And in fact, I, I know a woman in Connecticut who uh, still, you know, she was in, in <laughs> you know, her family will still go back in China, and, and they, they'll go back and visit family in Shanghai, but she still doesn't trust the party. She doesn't want to go back. They're evil, you know. So some people, you know, carry that. But they, they held on to their faith of what sustained them. But they also went through very difficult uh, times. Tom. Yeah. There was one way to look at the church in terms of uh, 
in terms of the Cultural Revolution, like they missed Vatican II, basically. Right, they, sure. They were doing all of this stuff, and they were either shut down, so their memories of the church were very much pre-Vatican II, and they mm. described the Catholic Church as one that didn't go through any kind of reform like that, though there is vernacular reform. Yeah. On the other hand, China is this place where there's this... Uh, this incubator of messianic new religions, oh, yeah, sure. sort of non-orthodoxies of various sorts among Christianity. Where do you see things standing now? I mean, are there are the divisions within the church around orthodoxy versus not orthodoxy, or is it just a <coughs> patriotic association versus uh, you know, we suffered more than you did, or patriotic versus loyalty, um, or, or are there really sort of orthodox? questions bubbling up sort of the way we think of post-Vatican II America. Okay, so a couple of things. Well, you know, I, when I finally, the, the title for my book came at the very end. I didn't know I was at Cardinal Kung's last stand. That's too, uh, too Western, you know. Resistance, too French. This is what my editors were saying, right? So I, I didn't know, I mean, and finally we struck on it, a like church militant, like the movie Facebook, right? Not the Facebook, Facebook, right? So not the church militant, church militant. So that's uh, what we went with. And I know a Jesuit theologian in Loyola Marymount, he said, church militant, whatever happened to the pilgrim church, you know? So I think the <laughs> Vatican II was the pilgrim church. The 1950s, it was church militant, but it was, it was true. I mean, this was, this was the, the reality. And, and so in fact, in some ways, I, I end my book in 1960, which is when the trial takes place, but it's just before Vatican II. So I think that this, this is true, right? I went to Shanghai the first time in 1990, 80, 1990, after the Tiananmen Square incident, you know, and uh, I, I was looking for a church, and I went. I didn't know it was patriotic or what, and it was still celebrated in Latin. And then people t pulled me aside and told me some of the, you know, their experiences. But I was still you know, young, just out of college. I didn't pick up on all the nuances. But I think that all of those things are alive. That, uh, and, and it goes back and forth, because some people had gone back to China early on and said, we have to update them, right? So it's true. I mean, it's after Vatican II. You have to update the church in China. But also part of it was, oh, wait a minute. They're the ones that suffered, and you're coming in and updating them. So it led to all the classic kind of Catholic issues of, like, who's teaching who? But I think that, you know, they still, uh, you know, they, they did put the mass into vernacular. And, you know, the church is constantly changing, and I think that's happening in, 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 in Shanghai today. So you'll see all of the above. If you go to the English-speaking masses in Shanghai, it'll look pretty much like it would in any other city. But there are still issues, these deeper issues about, you know, they, they kind of miss Vatican II, that whole leadership was knocked out, but the church did survive. So all of those things are, are, are alive. Any other? Go ahead. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, apathetic, more or less, about it. Would you say there's kind of a, a, uh, a, um, a dot program or some kind of method to, you know, try to convert Chinese, uh, you know, Chinese people without religion or something like that? You know, where people are at in China, it, uh, most of my stories are, you know, anecdotal. I, you know, I tend to do more history than kind of, you know, generating these, this data or table. And I'm always struck, you know, I meet Chinese graduate students that come to the U.S. or go to China, and some will just, oh, yeah, I mean, God, you know, uh, they say this is an unofficial church or an underground church, but there at Christmas, you know, you know it's packed, and, uh, and it, you know, and, and there's this big church, Shouang, in Beijing. And on the other hand, I've met, uh, you know, other Chinese who basically, right to my face, say, oh, we're not a religious people. We have no, nothing to do with religion. And I think both are right, you know, but I think we would get the same in the United States to some extent, too. I mean, it's, it's kind of that great marketplace of ideas. You get both. You get people who are intensely religious or searching or interested, and others will just categorically, st you know, it could... I, uh, anyway, I was in China one time, and they said that gambling is illegal, and you look down the, the back end, you know, it's okay, so, yeah, thank you. You know, the same type of thing with religion, right? I mean, this great kind of... You know, there's great gray space in China now where a lot of these things are... Cont so, so it's exciting. In fact, I was at one place in Taiyuan, in an in, in, in inland city, and they were almost like evangelizing on the street. You know, some, some, some people were just in front of the cathedral sort of handing things out and singing or whatever, and 
I thought, wow, I don't know if they could do this in Beijing, but here they are, you know. So there's, there's all this stuff going on that I think which, which makes it quite exciting. I could be here till 1 a.m., but should I go a few, few more minutes or one more, one more uh, question? Go ahead. Right, right, right. And giving the sacraments, does the Vatican recognize those? And also, for instance, something like confession, does the Chinese government recognize that? Or do the priests have to really tell? Okay, I think overall the Vatican has stepped back pretty far. Like there are neuralgic issues about who the legitimate bishop is and, and who's you know, sowing confusion or dissension. That's very big for them. But I don't think that they will proclaim, they, they've actually been silent on a lot of these things. You know, so I have heard of cases where a priest studied in the U.S., goes back when Jin was illegitimate, and really, I don't want to be ordained by my own bishop who sent me overseas, because he's not, you know, so they, they, it causes problems for them. But for most people, I don't think, in fact, the, the Pope's letter would say that even if you go to an uh, um, a illegitimate bishop's church, and that's the only place you can go. You can still, there's still valid sacraments, basically. Now, whether, you know, confirmation, I don't know, but basically they paint with a broader brush. Then they would still recognize them as valid. So not to have too many, even some very conservative church people I know would say, don't worry about attending which churches unless you absolutely know for sure this is beyond the pale. So I think that they live and let live, but they realize the situation is not ideal. Like if it could be misused, yeah. 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 yeah, that I don't know. I I don't. I didn't ask. Yeah. I try not to ask too much about you, right? I just try to not ask too much about. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know. I uh, 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 it, that could be an issue, but I I hope it isn't. Yeah. Thank you very okay, much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>